innocent church scavenger hunt unexpectedly leads to a dead body. All signs point to foul play. To catch the killer, detectives will enter into a world of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And this hunt is far from fun and games. A seemingly quiet Halloween night, Detective Booker discovers what could be a discarded Halloween decoration of a dead body. But becoming suspicious, Booker checks the body for a pulse, only to realize to his horror that it's an authentic corpse. It probably doesn't surprise anyone that bodies are found on Halloween, and there's hardly a tougher time to investigate. Detective Booker discovers an alarming clue placed conveniently over the body. Written on a poster board are the words, yes, Matthew is dead, but his body not felt. Those brains were not Matt's because his body did melt. For Billy threw Matthew in some hot boiling oil to confuse the police for the mystery they did toil. Police begin a search of the immediate area, scouring the church grounds for any more clues or accidental evidence the killer may have left behind. What they find are more and more riddles. The next one, found under the mat of the church door, reads, a quick search inside to find the source of sin, and then near the cemetery to find its victim again. Deciphering the riddle to mean another murder victim could be found in the cemetery or possibly the church's sanctuary, the detectives split up, beginning a wild goose chase for another body. Police find nothing inside the church, but Detective Booker returns with another riddle from the cemetery. The last clue to end your search, find the altar where Noah's dove would perch. It's an odd clue and one that leaves everyone of the police force absolutely baffled. Checking the victim's wallet leads to an identification. The ID belongs to Kurt Flair, a local drug addict and petty theft known to many of the officers at the scene due to prior arrests. But the ID also leaves another clue. The fact that it's there means his killer never had any intention of hiding the identity of his victim. This and the riddles left behind could mean every detective's worst nightmare. It's a random killing. In the meantime, Detective Booker takes the riddles in for DNA testing, but the case hits another speed bump when they can't find a matching fingerprint in their database. Detective Booker's new job just got a whole lot tougher as he is left to notify Kurt's mother, Karen, of his passing and question her. Karen Flair, sporting a rap sheet that includes prostitution and drug abuse, is no stranger to the Seattle Police Department. The news of Kurt's death barely affects her at all. She says the last time she and Kurt spoke, he had just gotten out of rehab and was swearing he would remain sober. Coming up short, he turns to the autopsy report to find that Kurt's cause of death was at the hands of a drug called a speedball, an often lethal mix of heroin and cocaine. Across town, police find a solid lead in a drug dealer, Ace Horowitz, who was often seen running in the same circles as Kurt. They quickly bring him in for questioning. One great thing about drug dealers is if you threaten to charge them with a crime, like accessory to murder, they become very helpful. According to Ace, Kurt seemingly found religion and sought Ace out to convert him to the faith and save him from his sinful ways. But when Ace wouldn't accept Kurt's help, the two argued and were never to be seen together again. Not having any hard evidence to keep Ace in their custody, he is released. But something about his story strikes Booker as odd. He realized that he never told Ace that Kurt's body was found near a church. But still, Ace told them that Kurt had recently converted to Christianity. Booker quickly realizes his mistake and rallies a group to round him up again. They approach Ace's dilapidated apartment and having probable cause, they quickly burst inside only to find his apartment empty. As officers continue to search for Ace, Detective Booker returns to the scene of the crime one last time to search for more clues. But when he arrives, he finds a group of gawking teenagers waiting outside the crime scene tape. 
eager to learn what has taken place recently. Showing a little bit of a facial tick, the leader of the group introduces himself as Jeff Torringson, the son of the church's preacher, Pastor Torringson. Thinking that it's possible the kids could know something, Booker explains that the body of Kurt Flair was found on the church grounds two nights prior and that they are still looking for any leads that could help them find his killer. Jeff tells Detective Booker that Kurt was a part of their youth group and that he had not been answering their calls to attend a Christian rock concert with the band Praise. Upon further questioning, Kurt's standing as a newly devoted Jesus freak becomes all the more apparent as Jeff and his friends rattle on about Kurt's persistence in attending every youth group function the church offered. Jeff even claims that Kurt had expressed interest in attending seminary school and his father, Pastor Torrington, had promised to pay for it. Booker is stunned to discover that some of Ace Horowitz's story is true, which makes his evading of police all the more suspicious. Detective Booker questions Pastor Torrington on Kurt's history with the church and finds a colorful redemption story. He was welcomed to the church family by most of the parish and even developed a close bond with Paul himself. When Kurt told the pastor about his tumultuous living situation, the preacher let him stay at the church for as long as he needed. Religious conversions of drug addicts, we hear it every day and sometimes we're skeptical about them, but this one seemed real. So if that's true and Kurt was clean, why is he laying dead from a speedball overdose? And why is Ace Horowitz in the wind? After Paul's voluntary interview, Booker informs him of the clues the alleged killer left behind all over the crime scene. But when Booker shows him the riddles, the pastor suddenly turns pale. Pastor Torrington explains that he was the one who wrote the riddles, but never intended for them to appear at the scene of a murder. Paul says that he made the riddles that morning for a Halloween scavenger hunt for the youth group. But because of the holiday, there was a lower turnout than he expected, and the scavenger hunt was to be postponed until the next weekend. He just forgot to take the clues down. All their theories get tossed out of the window. These aren't a series of murderous riddles. These are biblical illusions. There's no genius killer out there. I mean, is there a killer at all? I mean, this could simply be a suicide. But Detective Booker still has questions to his dissolving mystery that continue to push his investigation in the direction of homicide. He wonders aloud to his partner, if it was a suicide that Ace Horowitz wasn't involved with, why was he running? And since when does a drug addict relapse into a drug as hard as speedball? Drug use is tricky at best. And seasoned addicts know that if you're going to relapse, you shouldn't dive in too hard and heavy because you might die. Kurt Flair had been a drug user the bulk of his life, so he should have known better, and police wondered, was this overdose accidental? Then, two more clues fall into Detective Booker's lap. After another scan of the murder scene, police find a small baggie with drug residue in the bushes nearby where Kurt's body was found. On the bag is a fingerprint that detectives hope will finally point to a killer. Pastor Torrington also tells police that the day of the scavenger hunt, a small amount of money went missing from the church. Detectives now have a new possible theory. Did Kurt Flair rob the church in order to purchase drugs? And if so, did he purchase them from Ace Horowitz? Police quickly send the drug baggie over to discover just who the mystery fingerprint belongs to. Police finally corner Ace at a local hangout and bring him in. But as Ace is waiting to be charged, another twist is thrown into the case. The fingerprints on the baggie don't belong to Ace Horowitz. In fact, the prints don't belong to anyone in the database at all. But Detective Booker still has one last Hail Mary play up his sleeve. Police know that Ace was selling drugs the week of Kurt's death, and now they know that money went missing from the church the day Kurt died. They assume that somebody from the church purchased the drugs, and they also assume that they purchased those drugs from Ace because of his previous connection with Kurt. Ace admits to selling drugs the morning of Kurt's death, but he claims he never sold anything to Kurt and hadn't since Kurt converted to Christianity. 
When asked by detectives why he ran away from police, Ace explained that the only alibi he had the night of Kurt's death was that he paid Kurt's mother, Karen, for sex and was otherwise occupied. You want to know the truth? Yeah, I was banging his mom. Detectives quickly track down Karen and confirm his alibi, leading them to their next question. Who did you sell drugs to on the morning of Kurt's death? Ace runs through a mental list of his clientele, but every name he gives Booker appears in the police database and isn't a match for the fingerprint on the drug baggie found at the crime scene. Finally, Ace recalls a client that day, someone who seemed as though they were a first-time buyer. Ace claims he never got a name from this mystery client, but describes him as an older, short, nerdy teenager with a slight facial tick. Detective Booker is quick to put a name to a face, Jeff Torrington, the pastor's son. Booker arrests Jeff Torrington on the charge of homicide. In processing, detectives are able to score a match of Jeff's fingerprints on the drug baggie found at the scene of the crime. Now things are starting to fit into place. They know who the fingerprints belong to, they've got somebody connected to both Kurt and Ace, and they've got the crime scene. But you can have all the evidence in the world, but you still need motive, and they don't got it. Jeff admits to purchasing the drugs from Horowitz, but claims he never intended for Kurt to overdose. He says that in recent meetings, he had considered Kurt to become more withdrawn and quiet, he was worried he was on the verge of a relapse. Having learned from his father how to deal and treat drug addicts, Jeff claims he meant to buy a small dosage, not a sandbag, so that Kurt could get an easy fix without fully relapsing. Police press harder, grilling Jeff for hours. If he was only trying to help, why did he steal money from the church instead of paying for the drugs himself? Why did he leave Kurt behind the dumpster under the clues to be discovered by just anyone? With all their leads spent, Detective Booker finally thinks he makes the right connection for motive. And he hits Jeff hard with it. Booker rails on Jeff, pushing him until he finally breaks and admits that he murdered Kurt because he felt as though he was being replaced as his father's only son. The morning of Kurt's murder, Jeff stole money from the church, purchased the speedball from Ace, and then blackmailed Kurt by saying that if he didn't take all the drugs, he would tell everyone that it was Kurt who stole the money take it. At the church, Jeff points his dad's gun at Kurt and forces him to inhale the speedball. When Kurt overdosed, Jeff moved the body behind the dumpster under his father's scavenger hunt clue, left to make an alibi for himself, and planned to return the following morning to discover Kurt dead and report it to police. With his confession, Jeff Torrington was charged with first-degree murder and charged with 25 years to life in prison. Jeff fell victim to a number of deadly sins, wrath, pride, but mainly envy. He was jealous of his father's relationship with Kurt. And in the end, he's gonna find out that it's difficult serving God while you're also serving life without parole.